Thank you, Madam Chairperson, Professor Janita Lienige, uh, members of the Council, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, very good morning to all of you. So uh, I warmly welcome you all to uh, my presentation on experimental investigation of uh, metamaterial for enhancing wireless power uh, transfer application. So I'm going to share uh, some of the highlights of my research work that I have done for uh, past five, six years. So. Uh, Without wasting much time, let me directly uh, let me directly uh, go to the introduction. So, uh, the story of the story of wireless power transfer uh, began with uh, one of the greatest scientists, who is Nikolai Tesla. He has a dream of uh, powering the whole world wirelessly in 1890, and he experiment. Uh, with that, with his famous uh, Tesla Tower, uh, which is located in Long Island, uh, New York, USA. But he was uh, a kind of failure, that project, because of the lack of funding and several other reasons. So after that, actually, several applications uh, were appeared, several publications were appeared in literature. But until uh, 2007, until uh, 2007, uh, the, this technology was not gained much popularity uh, because of uh, the uh, because of their uh, lack of certain parts for adapting for real world application. But in 2007, a group of researchers of MIT uh, they demonstrate wireless powering of a light a 60 watt light bulb at two meter distance with 40 percent efficient uh, efficiency. So after that, a lot of researchers uh, attracted to this uh, field of research, and eventually, the, some of the consumer applications were began to emerge. So nowadays, uh, these are some of the uh, commercially available applications in the market, uh, like wireless charging pad, uh, wireless power bank, wireless electric toothbrushes, and uh, those type of uh, uh, small scale power usage applications are available in the market. Uh, apart from that, uh, there are uh, certain applications where uh, high power is used, like the uh, wireless electric vehicle charges. So actually, the theoretical foundation for this particular field, which is called wireless power transfer, is laid by the famous uh, scientist Michael Paraday uh, in his uh, law of uh, Paraday's law of electromagnetic induction. So this is a case where this simple physics law is extended to real world application. Let me move on to the next slide. So as far as the uh, future envision is concerned, uh, in the future there might be uh, very uh, a kind of sophisticated application of this technology uh, in uh, implantable biomedical devices. Uh, wireless power transfer enabled coffee shops might be there in your home uh, when you go for your conference room. The your electronic gadgets, electronic devices, they might be powered up wirelessly. So with that in mind, uh, 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 moving toward that actually, the wireless power transfer technology, uh, there are uh, several classification. But what I was interested is resonant inductive coupling, where we use uh, magnetic fields to transfer power. So there we use the resonant circuit. And let me go to some sort of basics of this uh, technology. So as I previously mentioned, the Paraday's law of electromagnetic induction is the, uh, the key rule here. So in wireless power transfer system, basically uh, we have transmitter coil, receiver coil. And then there is a source loop, load loop. Uh, apart from those two loops, uh, 
uh, you have a certain electronic uh, circuit like RF power amplifier, impedance matching circuit, uh, frequency tracking circuit, etc. And in the receiver side, you have uh, several rectifier circuits and other power management circuit. So according to the principle of resonance, uh, if we can make uh, two objects to be resonate at the same frequency here the two uh, transmitter coil and receiver coil so they tend to uh, exchange energy more efficiently so that uh, energy exchange will happen with uh, evanescent or decaying magnetic fields so uh, with this resonant inductive coupling there are certain advantages that I have listed here so practically evaluate the efficacy of uh, this type of system, uh, two figure of merits uh, will be utilized, that is wireless power transfer efficiency and wireless power transfer system efficiency. So I'm not going to actually much technical details on them. So uh, let me go to the uh, that simple system. If I expand that system in kind of a detailed view, so in different, different locations. So previously I mentioned that uh, there are uh, some uh, power electronic circuit in uh, uh, in before this uh, source loop and also after the load loop uh, you have uh, several circuit so uh, we can expand those uh, different circuit like as I illustrated in this figure so at each location uh, where we have uh, different different researches that we can do so that is the classical uh, 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 research overview in this particular field so recently actually, apart from these uh, uh, points where we can improve certain parameters, certain optimizations by working on different, different location, uh, there are certain uh, novel concepts were emerged. So one of them were the wireless power focusing uh, using metamaterial. So that is what I was uh, uh, work on. And yeah, here again, I'm not going to the technical detail. So for the analysis of high frequency systems, we usually we utilize a scattering matrix parameter. So in terms of a scattering uh, matrix parameter, uh, considering wireless power transfer system as a two port network, so the efficiency can be derived to be equal to the square of the transmission matrix. So transmission matrix is S21. So we can actually reach to the same result using the lump circuit model analysis using the basic uh, 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 electric uh, circuit theory principles. And then, uh, so this actually the specialty of uh, why we use this S21 using the, the instrument called vector network analyzer, uh, which is a kind of uh, expanded uh, version uh, for uh, something like oscilloscope, but uh, uh, there are several uh, functionalities uh, that is uh, made available for measuring this scattering matrix parameter with vector network analyzer. So utilizing the vector network analyzer, we can practically measure these values. So that is why uh, in high, not only for wireless power transfer, but also for other uh, high frequency circuit and system analysis, we uh, typically use a scattering matrix parameters or simply the S parameters. And then uh, let's see a little bit about the meta materials. So the term meta is a, a Greek term. The meaning of the term meta is beyond. So the term meta materials denote something beyond natural materials. So meta material is a kind of artificial material that we have to uh, that the human has to create it. So that is not available in nature. So it is a, a kind of material uh, created or made by scientists which shows certain uh, unique and exhaustic electromagnetic properties uh, properties which are not included in its individual component. So the two basic parameters uh, that uh, the material, uh, the two basic parameters uh, are there that is uh, electric permittivity and magnetic permeability depending on the sign of these uh, uh, two parameters we can classify uh, the available materials into four categories so typically these uh, permittivity and perme permeability values are positive so so those materials we are uh, we name them as double positive materials because both parameters are positive so likewise uh, we can actually have negative values 
artificially we can create materials with negative values for these two parameters. So, the material space can be divided into these four categories depending on the sign. So, uh, this picture is Victor Veselago, he is a Russian physicist, he is the one who first proposed the properties of uh, simultaneously uh, negative values of uh, epsilon and mu, so those are called double negative materials. Uh, so, he proposed this idea in uh, 18, uh, 1968, but the realization, practical realization happened in 2001 due to the, uh, the pioneering work of uh, these scientists. And as we consider the wireless power transfer, so we need the magnetic metamaterial where only this magnetic permeability is negative. So, this illustration actually is split ring resonator structures uh, are showing this uh, negative epsilon property. So, then uh, how do we realize this metamaterial? So, uh, metamaterials are everywhere in electromagnetic spectrum. So, for a uh, uh, gigahertz, terahertz range, we can use uh, uh, nanopotolithographic process to fabricate them, but the wireless power transfer systems and, uh, are working on uh, megahertz frequency. So, when it is come to the megahertz frequency, I select a kind of uh, ring resonate structure. So, that can be uh, uh, fabricated with standard uh, printed circuit board fabrication technology. So, that is what uh, uh, the, uh, this, uh, the material that I have selected to apply in wireless power transfer. So, what are the properties that is uh, uh, shown by this metamaterial? So, the properties uh, uh, that is shown by uh, there are uh, several. So, among them the negative refraction property and evanescent wave amplification are interest to me. So, because they can be applied for wireless power transfer enhancement. So, usually you know that the refractive index of a material is a positive value, but uh, artificially we can make it negative. So, the implication is this. So, if you put a, a pencil or kind of rod into a, a, a glass of water which is made with uh, this negative refraction material. So, you may see it like this. So, this property can be used to focus the energy coming from a source into a, a point which is located in uh, the other side of this left handed region. So, actually there are certain mathematical conditions in order to uh, practically realize this one. So, this property can be utilized for uh, uh, developing, uh, the actually it was a developed concept for the perfect lens. So, the perfect lens is capable of uh, focus both propagating far field waves as well as near field in uh, evanescent wave. So, with that we were able to overcome the uh, classical diffraction limit, the well known classical diffraction limit. So, the theory behind this one was usually uh, explained with uh, magnetoinductive surface waves or surface plasma and flow irritants. So, I am not going to actually uh, explain the technical details, but what we uh, are very simply, so when we uh, uh, propagate certain wave from a kind of source, usually the energy of that wave is going to be decay. But that decay can be recovered by placing this left handed material by increasing the amplitude. So, that is what the simplistic idea of uh, this particular uh, phenomena. And uh, this particular phenomena is first applied in near field imaging and then it transformed into the wireless power transfer research domain. And then actually, so then uh, uh, when the wireless power transfer applications are considered, the bulky metamaterial structures are, are not suitable. And also, it is uh, bulk metamaterial is uh, not necessary for that particular phenomena that I have previously explained to be happen. So, therefore, using two coupled planar sheet of metamaterials, we can support the surface mode resonance and thereby we can reconstruct the, the decaying uh, near field magnetic uh, waves. So, that concept actually I have published in uh, 2014 in Journal of Applied Physics. So, that is the first journal paper on this particular field that I have published. And so, these are the, the material design uh, uh, details. So, I select this type of, instead of a split ring resonator, I 
constitutes kind of a spiral resonator having high Q factor and so on. And then uh, this can be models using a kind of lump circuit model like this and using the effective uh, uh, medium parameter extraction method, we can show that for a particular frequency band, uh, the uh, magnetic permeability is going to be negative for this particular material. And then assembling uh, several, so this is actually called unit cell, one unit of this particular metamaterial. Then assembling uh, several of these materials, we can make a metamaterial and then uh, utilizing the EM uh, simulation tools which are uh, commercially used for uh, this type of research. Uh, the evanescent field enhancement will be shown. And then this uh, theoretical or simulated study was uh, experimental validated with this particular model. There are actually certain disadvantage because uh, here the, the, the space between transmitter and receiver will be blocked by this one. But anyhow, at that time, it's a concept development. So we were, I were able to enhance the efficiency. So this uh, dash line, black dash line shows the efficiency without having the metamaterial. So applying certain different arrangement of metamaterial, I can enhance uh, the efficiency of wireless power transfer. And several other optimization results were also published in the same research paper. Actually, this was one of the key paper that I have published and now it's uh, around uh, almost very close to the citation 100 around uh, within this six year, it goes for 100 citation. It's around 100 actually, not reached to the 100. And then uh, in wireless power transfer system, uh, the consumers are uh, prepared to place uh, their wireless charging devices freely. But in order to have uh, maximum efficiency, so we have to align the transmitter coil with the receiver coil. So for that actually, uh, 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 then actually that uh, consumer end, so they like to move it here and there, then they are for uh, when we misalign the transmitter coil which is embedded in the wireless power charging device, there might be several uh, lateral as well as angular misalignment. So that cause a dramatic reduction of the wireless power transfer efficiency. So in order to address that problem, uh, people, other scientists have actually utilized uh, several different methods. So I apply a kind of metamaterial called anisotropic metamaterial. And that was that idea was published in uh, Journal of Physics, uh, Applied Physics in 2015. And so this is the uh, graphical illustration of uh, uh, lateral and also angular displacement. Uh, and the concept was first uh, validated with EM simulation and then it was uh, aided with experimental result. And then actually uh, one of my recent publication in Nature Scientific Report in 2019 actually. So I uh, introduced a novel concept which is called wireless power transfer hotspot concept. So these wireless power transfer systems, they use uh, magnetic field uh, as well as the, the magnetic field means actually we are utilizing the radio frequency band. So there are certain radio frequency flux leakage other than the intended receiver. So if this uh, unwanted flux leakage is exposed by human, and, and that will induce a kind of heat on body tissue making health hazard. So in order to uh, prevent those uh, uh, health hazard, this maximum permissible exposure uh, of time varying magnetic fields uh, was specified by ICNRP, uh, uh, International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection Rules uh, published in 98 and updated in 2010, and also IEEE 95.1-2005 guideline. So they, uh, so therefore there is a high demand from the consumer end for reducing this flux leakage. With that demand, a concept called selective wireless power transfer has been emerged that is actually delivering the required or the precise amount of power only to the, the location where it's need in multiple receiver environment. So this led to the concept of wireless power transfer hotspot and that was published in Nature Scientific Report last year. 
and actually the conceptual origin of this uh, hottest stop is going into the photonic crystal. So photonic crystals are kind of uh, periodic optical structures that can control the flow of light. So there is a, a uh, the photonic band gap in uh, uh, the, the photonic crystal which reduces the loss by prohibiting the light propagation at unwanted frequencies. So creating a kind of cavity structure inside this band gap, actually band gap means a kind of a frequency uh, the region where the frequency is not propagating. So if we can create a band gap within this, uh, 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 we, we can create a cavity within this band gap that will allow a kind of uh, propagation localizing the light into the cavity region. So the same thing actually uh, observed later on the metamaterial actually which is called hybridization band gap and that theory is called Fano type interference. So that is capable of localizing the uh, field into a certain specific region. So electromagnetic field into a certain uh, uh, location. So we call this high intense point as hot spot there and that was first observed in uh, plasmonic metamaterial uh, uh, where they worked on terahertz frequency range. So the different people are actually utilizing different methods to do that. Uh, taking that original concept from uh, terahertz frequency range, so I uh, uh, make certain changes in the material to apply that in megahertz range. So that is what I did. Taking the concept from photonic brand gap, uh, plasmonic metamaterial and uh, protonic crystals which are working terahertz frequencies that concept is applied in uh, megahertz range and uh, with that actually uh, uh, with the available metamaterial we uh, me and some other co workers of mine go for a quick publication in applied physics express in 2016 so these are the result the initial results that were published and then actually I have a kind of conceptual envision uh, for a kind of table like a structure where the metamaterial structure is placed beneath the table and wireless power transmitter is located beneath the floor. And then uh, when we put certain device like laptop, mobile phone or a wireless uh, uh, heater, so we need to deliver power only to that particular location without transmitting a pre-space power just by activating certain uh, unit cell. So that is the conceptual uh, envision that I had in the beginning that came into my mind. So realizing this one, so I go for a kind of active metamaterial. So metamaterial can be classified into two categories uh, as uh, passive metamaterials and active metamaterials. So the passive metamaterials, once we fabricate, uh, we can't change, we can't reconfigure. But by embedding certain electronic devices uh, like diodes and uh, some uh, kind of things, uh, usually the, uh, the very cap diode, the, the uh, where the, the diode uh, junction voltage will change the capacitance of the, that particular component. Using those type of active components, we may embed those things to the metamaterial cell so that we can have a kind of uh, a frequency changing frequency modification characteristics. So with that actually uh, uh, using standard PCB fabrication technology, I developed uh, this particular unit cell and uh, on top of actually using surface mount device, there is a small circuitry there and uh, we achieve certain frequency. So the resonance frequency uh, where these uh, magneto inductive waves are generated can be changed by changing the voltage. And then uh, these are the results that I published in that uh, Nature Scientific Reports. So we make, uh, I, I have observed that particular uh, band gap, hybridization band gap for magnetic inductive waves. So by creating a cavity in that particular region, I was able to localize the magnetic field into that particular region. So this is the actual uh, metamaterial. Actually, it is a not a material, it is a meta surface, just one layer of this PCB structure. And so I was able to uh, practically realize uh, the hot spot. Again, actually, first uh, this was tried with the EM simulation using uh, uh, HFSS, commercially available high frequency structure simulation software. And then it was uh, realized, it was actually verified by uh, the experimental result.
and this is the uh, uh, the conceptual illustration of uh, selective multi-zone power focusing so we can create hot spots which uh, the field intensities uh, the places where this field intensity is very high and the same thing actually for the purpose of understanding so the regions where we have higher magnetic fields so they can if we place a kind of uh, uh, wireless receiver on top of this region we can extract energy from those point so that is what i have done and with that concept actually uh, experimentally uh, evaluate with this experimental arrangement and then it has uh, uh, converted into the real world application placing uh, several receivers on top of that table kind of a structure and uh, powering up certain light bulb uh, uh, according to the uh, way we need so i did the uh, hot spot location control so wherever we can change the location by the control circuitry attached to this particular metamaterial structure and then uh, uh, we can control the shape the different shapes can be activated uh, so depending on the shape of the wireless uh, receiver uh, we can control the shape and also we can control the intensity of the hot spot that means we can control the amount of power according to the amount of power required by the receiver we can control that and also i create certain wireless energy routing channels where we place a transmitter here and receiver here so that uh, uh, there is no physical wire but wireless energy routing channel can be created on the surface of the uh, meta material meta surface structure so those are the things that i have published in that uh, a nature scientific report publication and uh, after that uh, nowadays actually there is a very high demand for this uh, flexible electronic application which can be bendable rollable stretchable and that will i guess that will be the next technology jump that is happening these days so there are several options available for powering this system with a durable and reliable way flexible battery stretchable battery uh, touch responsive nano generator films piezoelectric till film energy harvesting that is actually one of our ongoing research and also rf energy harvesting that is also kind of ongoing research and the other option is wireless power transfer so with very simplistic arrangement actually i have tried this in uh, 2015 and certain results were public uh, published in uh, one of the international conference and so these are the results uh, with some kind of bendable receiver the initial uh, concept uh, were verified with this result and uh, yeah these are the results that i have published in that particular conference and this nature scientific uh, report paper and also this uh, last concept the bendable receiver was uh, actually we apply for a korea domestic patent and uh, which we obtained this one in 2007 i am sorry actually the document is actually the screen capture of the korea intellectual property of its uh, website and uh, these are the list of publications uh, on this particular wireless power transfer topic so apart from that major area of research uh, which is still ongoing so this is my vision for uh, future and also the ongoing research so at the beginning of this year so we uh, uh, me and several uh, my colleagues at the department of physics and electronic we receive uh, a head rrc fund for research innovation and con commercialization of consumer electronics for futuristic smart cities uh, targeting the international market and so there we have uh, uh, doing research in several areas actually so wireless power transfer and uh, rf energy har harnessing is uh, one of the extension of the work that i have done previously still that is done by uh, one of my uh, research assistant and uh, we are working on uh, supercapacitor assisted product and technologies and we recently we apply for uh, one uh, patent for one of the products that we have developed and also we are working on parametric speak uh, we are uh, that is also kind of acoustic wave propagation so we can propagate acoustic wave so in an environmental like this uh, we can if if i want to deliver my message only to intended zone so 
with parametric speaker, it is capable of delivering that message uh, into that particular region. And also the piezoelectric energy harvesting and low drop diode equivalent circuit. So we actually, in the piezoelectric energy harvesting, one of the major problem is the small power that is generated. So usual rectifiers uh, uh, that is uh, developed with rectifier, uh, the uh, commercially available diodes, they have uh, this forward voltage drop of uh, 0 0.7 or something around that. So, so with that, we cannot actually harness that energy. So therefore, we go for a low drop diode equivalent circuit. So with that, uh, we are working on uh, piezoelectric energy harnessing. And several other uh, the consumer products are also developing under this project. So this is a, a picture that I taken is uh, taken at the Samsung Electronic uh, Samsung Innovation at the Samsung Electronics uh, headquarters, uh, which is located uh, which is located very near to my campus there in South Korea. So <coughs> there I uh, got the idea of establishing a electronic uh, design and innovation center. Actually, when I proposed this one at uh, our department initially. It got a lot of comments, but finally I have managed to propose this one and uh, now it was ap uh, approved by the faculty board and also from the Senate of the University and current vice chancellor is strongly supporting this one and now it's under the council approval. And uh, with that actually, uh, actually uh, for the Samsung Electronic, they have their own uh, design and innovation center. So I got the initial idea from them when I visit them. Actually, I think this is in 2017, my last visit there. And with that actually, uh, and also the ongoing work, we are aiming to develop uh, consumer products for export income generation in collaborating with certain industries. And also I expect to look on talent development. That means train a younger scientist for the well-being of uh, futuristic academia and industry. So that is my vision for the uh, future research actually, uh, with the help of establishing this particular electronic design and innovation center. And uh, yeah, for one of actually, he is here, one of research assistant work, uh, we apply for a patent and that was accepted by Nippo and uh, the Gasset notice is still to be published. And we are currently searching for partner for commercializing this product. And these are the some of active collaboration that I have. And I have collaboration with uh, my PhD supervisor at uh, Information and Communication System on Chip uh, Research Center, Kyunghee University, South Korea, for the same kind of research that I talked about today. And also, I have collaboration with uh, Professor Nihal Kolaratn of uh, University of Waikato, New Zealand. And uh, we are working on supercapacitor acid power electronics. So one of uh, my research assistant, he's uh, working on this field toward his PhD. And also uh, one of my colleague uh, who is done PhD with me, he's a senior scientist now at the Vietnam Academy of Science and Technology. So I have collaboration with him. And then I have several industrial collaboration with uh, some of the top uh, uh, industries uh, in Sri Lanka for the commercialize the product that we develop under this grant actually. Yeah, so those are the things, highlighted things uh, that I uh, want to share with you actually. And finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, the Wireless Integrated System Laboratory of Kyunghee University, my collaborators there. And he, he uh, actually, uh, he is my uh, PhD supervisor, Professor John Nookley. And also uh, this photo is taken at, uh, so I want to actually, uh, Heartily thank for the Global Korea Scholarship uh, Program administrated by National Institute of International Education, Republic of Korea. So they are, this photo was taken at the orientation at 2010 actually, at NIID. And also I want, so they are the one who support me for my living for six years in my life in Korea. And I want to acknowledge the Brain Korea 21 Plus program of National Research Foundation, Republic of Korea, uh, for providing me the equipment and component, the, the equipment grant actually for my research. And also I want to thank the University Industry Cooperation Foundation of Kyunghee University, Republic of Korea. Uh, not only from Korea actually, for the current work, uh, the head OMST of Ministry of Higher Education, uh, Sri Lanka actually, the project director 
director is our general uh, president, Professor Janitali Enege. So I want to acknowledge that for the 100 million grant uh, that they provide for ongoing research. And also, not only that actually, I want to thank uh, my parents and three of my kids actually, Tisanga, Tisala and Gesandi. Uh, so I, I am taking all their time uh, without being with them actually for doing this type of work. Yeah, those are the things uh, that I want to share with you. And I uh, also, I would express my thanks uh, for all who are coming today to listen my address. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Dr. Anavira, uh, for that very informative and uh, physics uh, talk. Uh, and uh, this is a small appreciation from the SLAS for conducting such a wonderful uh, section this year. The next presidential address is by the Section E3, the president of Section E3 slash 2020 is uh, Dr. Chatura Rajapaksha. Dr. Chatura Rajapaksha is currently serving as a senior lecturer in computing at the Department of uh, Industrial Management in the Faculty of Science, University of Kalania. And he did his B B BSc is also from the same department at Kalania. And he has done his M in, in Tokyo in Institute of Technology in Japan, and also his B in, in the same uh, institute in 2015. And he has he's serving as, the se as a senior lecturer in grade one since 2018 and he has uh, many achievements and long profile. So Dr. Chatura Rajapaksha, the floor is to you. Right, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Janita, for your introduction. Uh, it's a quite fascinating experience to talk in front of uh, some empty seats, but I hope uh, colleagues are uh, listening online uh, to the talk. Uh, so my, the title of my talk is uh, 
artificial intelligence for policy making, the complex systems perspective. So when uh, you talk about artificial intelligence, uh, you may be thinking about you know some fancy stuff, robots, high tech machinery, and you know taking uh, very very uh, impressive and kind of uh, uh, insights from large volumes of data and all those kind of things, right? So artificial intelligence is like you know it's a very broad area, and. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a specific, uh, quite unheard, and little bit uh, uh, less less used area of artificial intelligence, which I think and I believe is very important for the policy makers to make better policies. Now, in artificial intelligence, if you like artificial intelligence, you can you know uh, classify artificial intelligence to just a couple of major segments like the strong artificial intelligence and weak artificial intelligence. So in, in I'm going to particularly talk about this weak portion of artificial intelligence where you use artificial intelligence for some narrow and specific problem tasks. Right, the problem area that I'm going to define today is policy making. Now, uh, the previous presenter, my friend, uh, uh, Dr. Aruna, he was talking about uh, some, some impressive innovations in, in the domain of physics. And likewise, around the globe, even now, the, the scientists are discovering some uh, fabulous uh, findings, research findings in basic and natural sciences. And people, you know, are quite busy by by, by you know, applying those things into appliances and you know, they are brought to the, the consumer markets, but after all, it, they all become part of our societies. People are going to use them, right? People are going to use them and people, when the people use them, they become, you know, uh, the, 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 our world, our environment get affected, improved in different and multiple ways, right? Without understanding those things, without understanding those consequences, we may not be able to make better policies. Right? After all, the policies are social. So I'm Chatur Rajapaksha, a senior lecturer of the Department of Industrial Management. I'm going to talk a little bit around this domain, and I'm going to introduce you a, an important artificial intelligence tool uh, that can be used by policymakers to create better policies by exploring the complexity in the world that we are living in. So at the inauguration ceremony, our general president uh, very correctly mentioned that the scientists and policy makers must work together, right? So we, as a scientist, what is our role, right, in this world? Like, why do we exist? Why are the societies like SLAS exist? Why do we, we people, group of scientists from different domains, why do we get together and, you know, uh, wh what are we contributing to, right? So policymakers, when the policymakers and scientists work together, what should be the outcome? The outcome should be evidence-based, adaptive policies, better policies to make our life better. As our theme says, science for quality life. Now, what is the role of the decision makers? So when the scientists and policymakers work together, what happens to the decision makers, right? So actually all these three parties, these three parties must work together to make our life better. Now at the moment, like at, uh, at the moment, we can say that the, the it's, there's a dis distance, right? So there's, there's a quite a bit of distance between the decision makers and the scientists and policy makers. So if the distance is bigger, right, what happens is the decision makers become bored and not involved because there's no much input from the scientists, scientific domains. What our target should be, that we have to make the decision makers more involved in this domain, more interested in this domain, and the better they are involved, the better they are interested, the life would be better for us. So in doing so, the biggest challenge we have is the complexity, right? Complexity in this world. Now, the public policies aim at complex problems in societies which are sometimes wicked. So let me talk a little bit uh, around that. Now, if you look at uh, 
the policy domain, the you know, it all started with some autocratic rules. The king's rule, king's vision became the policy of the country. That was the history, right? So king thinks about something and it becomes a policy. Everybody you know, absorbs it and then it can be right or wrong, so it's policy. But when the world developed, you know, that situation changed, right? Public interests and some interest groups' interests were taken into account. Then came statistic, right? So this, uh, somewhere around early 1900, the statistics came into the picture. So this continued for about half a decade, ha half a century, and then people gradually started that the, the area or the domain that we are you know, aiming our policies at are very complex. And they started to realize that the societies are not just linear systems, they are linear, but they're systems, right? Systems of interconnected components. So when you, uh, when you target a policy at such a system, right, the policy has to be adaptive. The reason is the system, you can't expect how the system is, uh, or rather you can't expect the system to behave the way you want, right? When you try to introduce something to the system, there can be unexpected consequences at different levels. Because, now take the, the battle against Govit, for example, right? So you introduce, uh, 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 say, uh, so, so you, you come up with certain restrictions, then people find ways out of that restrictions. You come up with uh, 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 some, some, uh, uh, insights, and then then people you see people go and you know lining up in front of some uh, local uh, media men, and you know they they uh, behave quite different from the way you expect them to behave, right? So likewise, the 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 social systems are complex, right? You can't really explain these problems, you can't really foresee from where the problem comes, right? And uh, sometimes you can't find a solution actually. Right? Such problems are called wicked because they have multiple facets and if you try to address from one facet, there can be quite a uh, large number of other facets which are going to be affected, which work adversely. So then how are we going to address this complexity? Right? For that, we have to understand that our society is a complex system. Right? It works as a complex system. The pr complex problems are coming from the complex systems. So by definition, a complex system is something that comprises of a large number of interacting components. A large number of interac interacting components. Therefore, the composition, the nature of the interactions, how do those uh, individual components interact with each other, right? and the learning of those individual entities and the environmental changes, all these things are going to affect, right? For example, if you keep lockdown for a long period, right, it's going to affect to the economies of people. Then people will start resisting. So your solution from one end can affect the larger community in different ways, right? So uh, now, the, the policy, may, on the other hand, when the individuals make different decisions, you can see quite large number of emergent properties coming out of this complex system. Now take traffic, for example, right? There's another familiar example for you all, I'm, I'm pretty sure. In case of traffic, now you see traffic jams on, on in, in, uh, in all the streets of Colombo, but if you try to find out why traffic emerge, there's no answer for you. Right? Individual drivers make decisions when they drive. Right? So when you are driving, for example, you don't look at the big picture. What you are looking at is the driver in front of you and probably the two drivers on both sides of you. Right? So you keep driving. Right? And whenever you see an empty space, if you are a tricer driver, you'll be, you know, try to cut, cut your way and you know, get into that empty space. Those are your local interactions with your environment. You are driver in front of you, drivers on both sides of you, and you see uh, the empty patches in the environment. You try to move to those patches, expecting that your journey will be fastened. But what's the outcome? When the individual components of those systems make decisions like that, 
the outcome is quite unpredictable, right? You see traffic jams forming, and in most cases, the reason for those traffic jams are unpredictable and unidentifiable. People, what people think, okay, the roads are not wider enough, right? The roads are not wider enough. If you make the road, uh, roads widen, then the traffic will be reduced, right? If you build, uh, if you reduce the number of cars to the country, then the, the, the traffic could be reduced. If you make the drivers disciplined, the traffic could be reduced. But how are you going to make the, traffic, the, the drivers disciplined? You need policies. Should you limit the number of cars coming into the country? We don't know, right? You must limit the, you must uh, uh, investigate and create policies regarding that. Okay, so locking down is also like that. What is the optimal lockdown strategy? Right, when should we lock down? At what time? Which area should be look locked down? With what kind of people should be targeted at? Especially when it comes to vaccine, right? What is our vaccination policy? Right, uh, so which kind of people should be vaccinated? Right, at what time should the vaccination start? How to identify the target groups? All these things are quite complex issues that we have in our society, right? So. What I'm trying to say is the complex system and the system's thinking is very, very important when it comes to crafting policies. So if we don't try to understand this complex system, we may not be able to create adaptive policies. So the challenge is understanding the complex system and create more adaptive and sustainable policies. Now why I'm saying adaptive because with the, the time, the environment may change, so your policy that seems to be working today may not be working another two months' time, right? That we experience sometimes in, in during this COVID period. You know, the policy that we adopted at the beginning of this situation may did not, you know, seem to be working well in the latter parts of the year, you know, see, seem to be, right? So I'm not saying it's, it was, but seem to be. So that, that's a problem of this adaptiveness, right? So we, for that, we have to understand how this complex system behaves, right? So the challenge is understanding that complex problem, right? So what I'm trying to show is that understanding this complex system is not very easy, right? I remember last year when I was doing addressing a uh, gathering at the, the AGM at a different forum, uh, I was telling that university ragging is also like that. And since we all are academics, you know, why this ragging emerge, right? So ragging is an emergent property, but what's the reason for that? What are the policies we have to control ragging, right? So we don't understand, right? If you ask the students, they say having a little bit of ragging is good, right? That's how they think. And the first year, we, we, we talk to the, the, the students, they are quite afraid and they are like very much panicked to be in the first year, but when it comes to the second year, third year, they, they say uh, having a little bit of ragging is good. Right? So what is this problem? Why, this, why those individuals behave like that? So I'm quite interested to see this year, now at our university, there's a batch who has spent without a, a single interaction with the seniors for one, one full year. So I'd like to see what's going to happen in the next year. If, they, if the university is open, are they going to continue ragging like that? What is going to happen to this subculture, the so-called subculture? So those are very interesting things that I'm looking at in our universities because they have spent one full year separated, isolated from the seniors and from the university system. So the subculture, if you look at the subculture as an emergent property of a complex system of students, academics, and other kind of stakeholders, political stakeholders, and other kind of stakeholders of this society, probably will be able to see some interesting stuff, and that would educate us a lot about the behaviors of this complex system. So I spent quite a lot of time in, on this slide because this is the core of my, my talk because without understanding the complexity, the policy makers act action may not be productive and effective, right? So we must try to have, uh, try to develop tools and techniques as scientists to help understanding this complexity. Right, so that's the idea of uh, the basic idea of this slide, and that's what I'm trying to explain here. So this is uh, uh, an example uh, of not understanding uh, the complex uh, complexity of, of systems. You know, like uh, as a uh, as an initiative to reduce the traffic, they introduced the traffic lane law and also the bus priority rule, and then you know after within a week, you saw so many changes taking place to that. Right. 
So uh, the, the, the removal of the, the uh, WPCs from the, the road duties and the threatening of some union leaders and then some alterations to the, the policies like to send bikes to take bus priority lanes, right? So, and, and it's, it's not heard now what's going to be the outcome of this, this uh, particular rule because of the COVID situation, right, unfortunately. But, but these are examples. So when you try to introduce a policy, there can be various aspects, which are the aspects and stakeholders who are going to be affected. And because of that, they are going to resist you. Right? They're going to resist you so that you have to go back to the square one, perhaps, and you know, change it. So these are the policy makers' questions. Right? What are the emerging issues? Right? They want to know what are the emerging issues, early warnings. Now, one of our research these days is uh, trying to identify the uh, incidents, right? likely in incidents from social media data. Right? Lucky that we have data these days, right? I'll, I'll be in very, very soon I'm going to talk about the revolution, big data revolution and what it's going to do for us. Uh, but we are trying to collect the, the social media posts and try to predict the incidents that are going to happen in the near future. Right? So the policy makers would like to know the emerging issues in the form of early warnings. Right? And then also they want to know why things happen that way, right? Why is this ragging continues despite all the actions by the University Grants Commission and the, the police and everyone? So why is this ragging continuing, right? We want to know, right? Policymakers must know it. They better understand that, right? We would like to know why these people behave uh, when, the, when the government announces a lockdown or uh, st uh, when, the, the, when the government asks them to stay at home. Why do they, they roam around the country, right? What is the, 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 what's the reason for that? So they have to understand why things happen that way and how things could be changed. Right? If we want to reduce the traffic, if we want to get the drivers disciplined, what should we do? Should we punish them? Should we award, uh, give them a reward? Should we reduce the number of vehicles? Should we improve the public transportation system? Right? So how? How can we solve these things? What actions need to be taken? What will happen? That is the future, right? If we do, if we introduce this policy today, in another two months' time, what's going to happen, right? So, and also different possible futures. It's not only one future, right? So, if it is one future, it's just simple predictions. Statistical predictions are, you know, aiming at that. But different possible futures. If we do it like this, what's going to happen? And if we, if we do it like this, then what's going to happen? Right? Different possible futures will have to be identified. And what went wrong? Right? So analysis of failures, postmortems. If a policy was failed, what's the reason for that failure? Right? So that we have to identify. Uh, the not, not we, the policymakers. Right? Those are the policymakers' questions. And as scientists, our task is helping them to get answers to these kind of problems. Okay? So, uh, now, adaptive policies were extended to data-driven policies, right? Because of this big data revolution. Now we have data, right? We have devices, as uh, Dr. Aruna mentioned, now they are trying to, you know, popularize consumer electronics. So consumer electronics will, you know, they, they give rise to so many devices that can capture data, right? Our locations can be captured. Uh, the GPS systems are so strong these days. We have sensory systems. We have social media. All those things. What all those things are doing is capturing data, right? They capture data, and data is available. Maybe not in the format that we want. Maybe we are not, they are not affordable to us, but it's there, right? So our task is then to take this data in, and you know, try to make better policies with the help of that data, right? So. Can we make adaptive policies with the help of data, right, which are made available to us with the big data revolution? So that is where this policy modeling and experimentation context comes in, right? What you are seeing here is the policy cycle, right? Uh, probably you are familiar with that, uh, you know, that, that we have to set up agendas, we have to identify the emerging issues, then we have to, you know, formulate policies. 
right? And then we have to adopt policies at these points. So for formulation and adoption and implementation heavily requires the modeling of policies and experimentation of policies. And for that, we, we try to you know, popularize the policy lab approach, right? Where we use the, the available real-time big data repositories and get that data in and model policies and experiment mod policies using modeling and simulation. So that's going to be uh, the idea, the next idea. Now, uh, now, the task then, when you want to do uh, policy modeling and experimentation, as I mentioned here, when you want to do policy modeling and experimentation, the science, what the science can do is build predictive models and simulations, right? We should be able to create predictive models and also simulations of uh, the complex systems as a result of the introduction of the policy. Machine learning models, now this is a branch of artificial intelligence. The machine learning models can help us in this case to build, make predictions about the future. And mathematical models, can capture system dynamics that we all know. But sometimes when you try to use mathematical models to capture system dynamics, you oversimplify the system's behavior because you have to narrow down, after all, the entire system dynamic into a set of equations, mathematical equations. So that's going to you know, narrow down your situation. So we are promoting a different alternative right, with the help of artificial intelligence for that. Now take a look at the first image. Uh, that's an image of small birds called starlings. They, they flock together. Right? They don't know advanced physics. They have never learned physics. Right? They're tiny birds with limited intelligence, and their actions are very, very limited, very simple, but they are capable of forming that structure. Right? They don't know about aerodynamics, but they form that structure. How do they form that? We don't know. Right? We, uh, Maybe the scientists know. I mean, the scientists, of course, know how, how do they form that structure. But I'm saying is what the layman's don't know, right? If you build a stone right at the middle of that structure, or if you take a gun and shoot at the right at the middle of that structure, what's going to happen? They will reform, right? They will reform those structures, OK? So you may have seen that, right? So how do they reform? Now, that's what we call swarm intelligence. Right? They, ha they are limitedly intelligent groups of creatures, but when they, th when they get together, they collectively exhibit uh, a, a very intelligent behavior in the nature. The second picture is also like that. Some of you know better than me about those things. Those are, you know, the, when you look at uh, some bacterial colonies uh, through microscopes, you can identify those patterns, right? Those are some rival colonies, as, as they have said, right? So the, the formation of some rival colonies, as you can observe, OK? So how do they form that? Collective intelligence, right? But uh, what I'm trying to say is, now, if you take the first picture, we have the camera lens to observe that. Right? We have the camera lens to observe that and see, OK, when you, when you pelt a stone at that one, how are they going to deform that and reform? You, can ha you have the microscope, which gives you a lens to see the, the, the way the bacterial colonies behave. But when it comes to social systems, right, you and me are part of social systems. And do we have a lens as such for a social system like that? Do we have a lens? We don't. right? We don't have a lens as such to look at the social systems. Had we got a lens to look at these social systems, the policymakers, I'm pretty sure, could have made better policies. Because pelting a stone to that flock of birds is like introducing a new policy. The society will be deformed and reformed. They will self-organize, and you know some kind of social order could be explained, or expected. But we don't have a lens, right? So we must, as scientists, we must think about a lens that we can create. So can artificial intelligence make a lens to look at uh, social systems, right? That is our next question, right? Now there, swarm intelligence gives us a better approach, right? Historically, for a long time, you know, the scientists had been studying about these collective behaviors of decentralized, self-organized systems, natural or artificial, mainly natural. Take a beehive, for example. Bees are not intelligent, 
right? They know only to dance, waggle dance. But through that waggle dance, it is found out that 80% of the time they, they, they choose their nest, right, at the most optimal location, right? The nest selection, where to set up their hive, okay? So they make that decision in an optimal manner in 80% of the time. How do they do that? They're not intel intelligent. Individual B is not intelligent. But if you, the scientists have found out that they collectively exhibit that behavior. If you like, take a look at the, uh, uh, an ant colony, people have observed ant colonies and they have you know, studied some collective intelligence in the ant colonies. Bird flocking, fish schools, right? So they have, have looked at those things. And then the scientists have you know, started to take the, the essence of their, their learning from those uh, uh, the, the collective behaviors into social systems, right? So, can swarm intelligence be used to simulate social systems, right? This area of artificial intelligence is called artificial societies, right? So, we are trying to create artificial societies with the help of artificial intelligence, and the approach that I am trying to promote is agent-based modeling. Right? We call it also multi-agent social simulation, agent-based social simulation, multi-agent systems. Uh, there can be uh, slight variations of multi-agent systems as well, but uh, generally, right? So, uh, so that all comes under this, this umbrella, agent-based modeling. Now, what we are doing here is it's actually a generative bottom-up approach to study emergent phenomena in social systems, right? So what we do is we take individual entities of a society and we model them as artificial agents, software components, right? So those individual agents then, you know, it's, it can be you, me, or anyone, X, Y, Z outside, you know, it can be a company, it can be a vehicle, it can be a, an animal, it can be a school, whatever, right? Kind of an entity that you can identify in the level of abstraction that you are talking about, okay? So you try to identify such entities and you try to model them as software components Right? And you try to model their you know, structures and interactions, behavioral patterns, right? and then you put them together. Right? Like you and me interact in this room, right? uh, there are five, six people here, and uh, you are like, kind of li listening to my talk, and probably you are taking something from that. So that's an interaction. Right? So that kind of interactions can be you know, created in silicon environments, like in simulated environments, if you model the individuals in societies as software components. And when you put them together, it's like you and I behave in our society, right? That's the basic idea that we are trying to talk about here. Now, when I talk about this in my classes, the students ask me, where's artificial intelligence? Because they are, they are expecting some kind of fancy thing, high-tech thing to happen, right, in this domain as well, right? So, because you call it artificial intelligence and you expect some kind of advanced robotic to happen here, but we don't want that to happen, right? So, this simple, very simple concept and we are trying to find the, trying to, you know, identify or learn the complexity in the systems that we are aiming at as scientists through this technique. So, the, to the, the answer to this question is, where is artificial intelligence? Now, it studies how simple individual behaviors give rise to complex macro-level patterns. Right? Your brain cannot process this much of information. You can't identify this. That is what, why you need these kind of techniques. Right? So we generate, it lets us to generate and test would-be world predictive models. Right? You can give different, you, know, you can make changes to the behavioral patterns. You, know, you can uh, uh, introduce new rules, new behavioral rules and all. And then see different would-be worlds. If you change it like this, what's going to happen? If you ch change like that, what's going to happen, right? And the next point is, intelligent techniques are used to model individual interactions. Uh, the, the, the historical, you know, this mathematic, uh, branches of mathematics like decision theory and game theory can be used to, you know, in, uh, model the human interactions, right? Uh, then evolutionary approaches, which are coming from, you know, like genetic algorithms can be used. Reinforcement learning, a branch of machine learning, can be used in this uh, in this uh, activity, like how, how to you know model the, the individual interactions. Then also we can discover rules from big data, right? We can use machine learning techniques to discover different behavioral patterns of these individual agents from big data. And there's another area called uh, learning classifier system. Then can also be used. I'm not going to go into it, so these technical details in this uh, talk, 
but these are the things that we can do. So, how to put these things into work? Should we create stuff from the scratch? No, we do not have to, right. So, what we are uh, trying to do is we try to create spatiotemporal simulation environment that can you know model the space as well as the time. Uh, but we do not have to create things from the scratch. There are you know the, the, the available tools, computing tools, software environments for us to do these things. So that is why as a part of my, my work, I am trying to popularize this among social scientists, not this uh, natural scientists, social scientists. They are generally considered to be not tech savvy. So they may not be, they are kind of thinking that artificial intelligence is a kind of high tech area, but I would, um, my, my effort is actually to popularize these kind of software environments for those people so that they can incorporate these techniques for their social scientific studies. Right? So, we have uh, uh, quite a few and some, some prominent ones are mentioned here, NetLogo, Repast and Mesa and these are actually uh, software libraries. NetLogo is very, very popular in other countries even though it is not much used in this country. Uh, Mesa is Python based, uh, so these are technical stuff, uh, I would like to omit those things. But this advancement of computing technology has enabled the creation of sophisticated software libraries and we can make use of these kind of software libraries. Uh, to create these would-be worlds and do our scientific experimentations regarding policies uh, on computers as simulations. This is a sample environment, this is nothing much, this is just a very, very simple sample environment uh, of NetLogo. As you can see on the left hand side, you have a pane here and that is uh, where you can set up different parameters. For example, this is a, a simulation of a, a lane, right, uh, and there are some vehicles. And the, the way those vehicles behave, uh, when one driver brakes, what is going to happen and how the traffic forms when a single driver press the brake and those kind of uh, things can be observed. This can be used, the point here is this environment can be used to study advanced complex systems in the same way, right. So in the left hand side, you can provide different system parameters. The bottom, you can see the, the output, the, or the outcome of the model. And that, that green square is where you actually see the spatiotemporal environment that the drivers are, you know, uh, behaving, right? So the last question is, uh, can you believe, right? Can you believe the outcome of these models? Because they are very simple and how are you going to believe these things? Can you create policies based on these simple software components, right? This is a all time question actually, right? So we need empirical data for modeling the individual components as well as for the calibration and validation. So we are not just blindly you know, creating the behaviors, we collect the real data as much as possible and then we try to enrich them, uh, enrich the behaviors of those software components with the help of those uh, empirical data. Reproducibility is critical. So when I say that my model works like that, someone else should be able to reproduce my model and produce the same result, right? Then you can, can be convincing, right? So, so to make the reproducibility, we have to have documentation standards and there are standards developed for that, right? So uh, you can see uh, in the literature, you can see growing use of, uh, use of this technology in, in diverse domains. For example, in, in some of my research, we are trying to use it in epidemiology. Right? Uh, how this epidemic spread and if you uh, introduce different lockdown strategies, what is going to be the impact, how to remove a lockdown strategy, right? So how, how to remove a lockdown, uh, can you flatten the curve by, by adopting a particular policy and those kind of things could be uh, interesting to see uh, on agent based environments. Uh, the land use uh, context, right? are we effectively using the limited land we have in this country, that can be uh, another application area. Traffic and transportation management is another area that we can adapt this. There are quite a lot of areas. I just put uh, the areas that I am a little bit interested at the moment. Uh, and uh, there is a strong support for this uh, kind of projects from the European Union, Japan and, and uh, similar countries. So uh, just a, a quick uh, introduction of some, some uh, renowned repositories where you you know, can find uh, more things about this, this uh, branch of research. Uh, the Journal of Artificial Societies and Social Simulation uh, and this uh, 
this particular website uh, that you can see on the bottom, uh, the bottom, uh, they kind of you know contain some useful resources for the scientists to know about this technique and read about it and see what kind of applications have been developed, and uh, and create their own models. So, in conclusion, right? Uh, so I, uh, the the whole essence of my talk was that uh, agent-based modeling is useful to give clear messages to policymakers, particularly when they are aiming at uh, complexities in, in uh, societies and try to you know develop policies to complex systems. Uh, so we have to you know come down from science and explain the problems and possible solutions, right? We have to give explanations about the complex systems for the policymakers so that they can you know. Uh, create better and adaptive policies. Use a language the policymakers understand. As you can see, the graphical environment, the spo say a spatial temporal environment, that's a perfect uh, language for a policymaker because it's an experimenting environment. They can, you know, make experiments on that language and also make convincing evidence. So when you see it happening on the silicon environment, the simulation environment, the outcome could be quite convincing. We have to at least we have to you know promote and make them convinced. You know at least we have to give an effort uh, as scientists to you know uh, convince the policymakers. So finally, I would like to conclude with uh, this uh, statement that I think everyone knows about this. All models are wrong, but some are useful. So we can't. We are, I'm not saying that uh, what's given as the output from these models are very very correct. Right. This applies to agent-based models as well. But what we are trying to do is at least to create some useful agent-based models so that policymakers can comfortably you know, create their policies. So with that, I would like to conclude this uh, presidential talk. I must uh, thank uh, the Council of SLAS, including the General President, uh, for giving me this opportunity and my members of my uh, committee in 2020, their, their fabulous support. and. Uh, my family members and, uh, and and all my friends and you know everyone I meet on on road so everybody giving me input so I'm like I'm looking at everyone's behavior I'm a, uh, so that gives me so much of learning right every meeting I attend every uh, occasion I attend everywhere I go everything I do everybody people animal countries uh, institutes everyone is giving me a little bit little bit of learning to help me you know put my my put those learning into my uh, research. So I thank everyone I meet uh, uh, every day uh, for, for the input that they are providing. So if somebody uh, who is listening to this is interested about this uh, uh, kind of work, uh, please do reach me through that email address. Uh, so we, I call it computational policy research. So we would like to see uh, more and more people joining with us. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, and your time. Thank you. So thank you very much, Dr. Chatura Rajapaksha, for, for your very informative, anyway, timely needed uh, presidential address. Um, very good if you can implement those ragging places and all in, within the university stuff. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is very useful to the UGC if you can. If we, if we get together and implement it, actually. So um, this, is, uh, your, this is an appreciation from the SLAs uh, for your contribution to, as the president of Section E3 at SLAS. Right? So we'll wind up.
the second session and also the morning sessions. And uh, we'll start the next session at... Uh, One, yeah, at 1.30, you can have the lovely lunch of BMICH. <laughs>